versus Titeflex Corporation. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the Court. My name is Kevin Peters, and I represent the appellant, Timothy Caron. This is an Article III standing case that uh, derives from a defective product, so alleged, that transports natural gas in many houses throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The product is a flexible gas pipe that, when exposed to lightning, either directly or when lightning hits the ground near it, is subject to perforation and then the contents, the gas, uh, is subject to uh, explosion. You say it's an Article Three standing case. Are you conceding that? No, I'm, I, I thought. You think that's a problem? I know that's where the district court that, that's the district characterized court. the case, but do you think that's correct? No, I mean, I think we, I, I think once we have a cause of action in this case, and we do under state court action, we, we meet Article Three standing. I think that we have alleged and we can prove eventually that the product is dangerously defective, but under Article 3, if the court considers as if I think the court should and must. Have to have a state cause of action on, in order to have Article 3 standing, or is a colorable claim under state law sufficient? I think I have to make out a prima facie case. I, I think I have to allege a plausible cause of action under either Twombly or Iannaccino, the state and federal standards. The question really is plausibility. And uh, so when we look at the pleadings in which this court does de novo to determine whether or not the court was right that we haven't alleged sufficient facts to meet Article Three standing, <clears throat> I think the question is incolorable. I think the question is plausibility. Uh, the, uh, whatever label one puts on it, uh, the most you're asserting is a risk of injury. Um, and... The district court, in a sort of shorthand, say, well, you know, the risk of lightning striking is right. rare. may not be the right way of looking at it, but um, you're, you, you transform the notion of risk of future injury to a uh, assertion that because of that risk, we overpaid for the product, and therefore I have injury now. Right. Um, it's an interesting assertion. Um, most states don't look favorably on that. But on the question of uh, the risk of future injury, isn't this an instance where the state regulatory authorities have looked at that risk and considered it significantly insubstantial because they continue to allow the sale of the product despite the degree of risk? And why should we be substituting our judgment for that of the expert agencies that have actually looked at the science of all of this? The question becomes, well, let me answer your question directly. I'm not asking you to substitute your judgment. What I'm suggesting is, is that the state regulators, uh, in their efforts to determine whether this product is safe or not, which obviously is done diligently and in good faith, may not have it right. And that's what we allege. We allege that this product is dangerously defective when exposed to conditions that haven't been tested by Tightflex. Normally, if the state regulators don't have it right, um, you go to state court and you um, assert that it's arbitrary, so on and so forth. Um, here, uh, the state regulators actually looked at this risk. Um, what, they suspended regulations for four months and then they came back and they said, no, the product is safe to sell. Um, you didn't challenge that, or nobody has. Those regulations have been around for a while. 
So I don't see how there is any present injury out of the sale of an approved product. Well, even if a product is approved and cigarettes come to mind, just because they do in this instance, doesn't necessarily mean that the product isn't dangerously defective if it can be proven so. In other words, the state regulators don't act as the jury in this context. Yes, but in those cases, Massachusetts at least has provided, has required some evidence of physiologic change, some sign of actual injury, not just the fear of risk of injury. Right. So in the Donovan case, for example, the court said there needs to be subcellular harm. Right. And in this context, what we say is, number one, we have an existing risk, or we should say existing damages and a substantial risk of future harm. Let's conflate them for a minute because I think that's where we're going unless I'm missing the court's point. In this context, what we say is this product has been not only in the United States, excuse me, pardon me, not only in Massachusetts, but obviously across the country, and there is an extent risk, there's a risk of explosion that is manifest. Now, we have my brothers and sisters who say, yes, 141 times, and that's not enough. But the question really becomes if this product should be manufactured in order to withstand a foreseeable circumstance, which is a lightning strike. So if we compare it to Donovan, which is a medical monitoring case, and we say whether there is a present harm, the present harm in this context is must there be or is it reasonable, I think, which is the standard, to remediate existing condition to preclude the possibility of a catastrophic injury. I'm having a little bit of difficulty understanding precisely what damage you say your client, looking at your complaint right now, suffers or will suffer. Okay, sir. I put it in the present and future tense. Do you allege any present injury, and if so, what? The present injury is that Mr. Caron bought a product that should be lightning safe. I don't know if anything is lightning proof, but lightning safe, and we allege that this product isn't lightning safe, and therefore one of two things are present economic injury, which begs additional questions, but I'll just answer your question, Judge. First economic injury is that he overpaid, because when you buy a product, you should get something that's. No, it's an economic injury. And the second economic injury is he should be in a position, and he can allege that for the cost of remediation, which is one of two things in the record, either replacement with iron pipe, which has been the standard for years. Suffered any non-economic injury? The non-economic injury is the substantial risk, which I think gets us into the Article III question, the substantial risk of a future injury, which I think is where Judge Ponzer said it's too remote, it's too speculative, because lightning is too speculative. So that's a separate question, which I'd be glad to go into. You know, the Supreme Court, with its Clapper decision, has revivified the whole area of probabilistic risk and seems to have returned to or reemphasized earlier Article III standing requirements, that it can't be speculative, can't be too remote, and which starts raising questions about how you go about measuring probabilistic risk. Right. The district court here said, oh, you know, lightning strikes irregularly, whatever. But I'd like to go back to my theme of the people who actually looked at this did some measurements, and they decided that the risk was too remote to stop them from allowing the sale of this product. The product does many good things. And so if we're in this, how do you measure probabilistic risk? Isn't this something that counts against you? I think that there's, in fairness to the process, a lot of steps between me and a jury. I concede that point. The first step, however, 
Article III standing, I think we may. Yeah, but you see, the Supreme Court has tightened up on that. Well, the Supreme Court in June of this year, in the Susan B. Anthony List case, went back, and although I can't say it's an exhaustive exploration of Clapper, said that if there's a substantial risk that harm will occur, that substantial risk is sufficient to give rise to Article III standing. And where we have an agency that says essentially there is no substantial risk, we're going to allow the sale of the product. But agencies approve the use of products all the time, and if the products are defective, notwithstanding the agency approval, the cause of action exists. No, but it does go to the... Probabilistic. Yes, right. It does, but if we take a look at what's been, and I see my... No, go ahead. I'll answer your question. Go ahead. If we go to see what's happened throughout the country and we see that this risk exists, the question becomes whether or not, as a matter of summary judgment under Rule 56, we'll ever survive. And as I say, I think... Well, no, the matter's been phrased as whether you've suffered enough injury to warrant being in a federal court. Right, and I would rely on, obviously, the jurisprudence in the Supreme Court and this court. I'd point out that the Bauer Court from the Second Circuit, the Bauer case that you may have read, which has to do with mad cow disease in downed cattle, the risk of mad cow disease was much more remote. Yes, that's true, but that's a... The food liability probabilistic risk law is actually its own category of law. Except that the Second Circuit has used that very standard to find Article III standing in three more recent cases, which I can give you the cites to... That are not food... That are not food-related cases. That's correct. Can you give us those cases in a 28-J letter? I will. You haven't so far in your argument mentioned the Johnson Insulation case. Why? I mean, I'm very surprised that you didn't come up here and hit me over the head with it. Well, I was... Perhaps I should have. So the Johnson Insulation case has to do with asbestos. The question at that point in time is whether or not there's an existing harm, even though you don't have anyone who is coming forward and saying, I have asbestosis. And the court, the SJC in the Johnson case, as you've known, said, yes, there is standing to bring a case here because the cost of remediation, it's not quite clear how they find property damage, but they do find property damage. So our case is like Johnson in the sense that if you have a product that's dangerously defective and it's installed in a home, that in and of itself is sufficient to give rise or may be sufficient to give rise to a cause of action. Standing in state court, in other words, getting past 12B-6, motion to dismiss. And I haven't dealt with the issue, nor will I raise a subject to the court, the issue of economic loss, which is a big issue in this case. I see I'm out of time, and I'd rely on my briefs on that, unless there are more questions. No, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the Court. John Papiano for the Defendant Appellee Tight Flex Corporation. Your Honors, Judge Ponser properly dismissed this complaint because the plaintiff lacks standing. He lacks standing because he purchased a product that works, he suffered no harm, and he faces no imminent risk of harm or even a substantial risk that harm will follow. He has a product, as the Court recognizes, that Massachusetts permits and has permitted for 20 years, that Florida, where he resides, permits the installation and use where every state. You know, I draw a distinction. The mere permitting of a product means one thing if they haven't looked at the risk. It means something else if they have looked at the risk. And as I understand it, Massachusetts did look at the risk. Did Florida look at the risk? I don't know if Florida looked at the risk the way Massachusetts did. Massachusetts certainly did. But I think what's important to know when we're looking at this product and the efficacy or safety of the product, this is not a product, remember, that came out last week or last year. This is a product that's been on the market for 20 years, and that's in over, as the plaintiff alleges, over half the homes in the United States. There's an empirical data we have about whether there is a substantial likelihood or whether harm is certainly impending, and their own allegations show just how remote and unlikely that is. 
they they talk about one hundred forty one reports of fires involving lightning in c s s t but even that which is less than three thousandths of one percent overstates their case because that includes all manufacturers of the product it doesn't account for whether the product was properly installed which is a which is a the one of the critical facts and it doesn't account for whether the product caused the fire and you know so so when we're looking at is this well is there a substantial likelihood that harm will follow and the answer as the plaintiffs make for us is no it's not going to happen and if there were a reasonable or high even taking the clapper dissent reasonable probability that harm will follow you know i would submit i would not be up here right now because we would see over twenty years the harm that supposedly follows from the use of this product what is the in your view then the element missing with it so that there's not a cause of action under massachusetts law i'm struggling with i i don't i'm not an expert in massachusetts law what's missing under massachusetts law the in the supreme judicial court said if you have a product that hasn't malfunctioned and you just say it's defective and i've suffered an economic loss and you're what you're seeing is purely economic loss that you have to allege that the product fails to meet a standard that's legally required by and enforced by the government and the plaintiffs haven't done here and in fact massachusetts permits the installation use of the product and some jurisdictions especially in the eighth circuit require the manifestation of a defect is categorically massachusetts doesn't go that far but they say look if you're just if you have a product that has a malfunction you need to show us a standard against which this could be measured and it needs to be a standard legally required by and enforced by the government and that's why they don't have a claim under massachusetts law why how do you distinguish the johnson insulation case well johnson insulation um if i'm correct comes before in a chino but 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 more important that's a that's a a meta that's what it amounts to in a monitoring type case an asbestos case where you there's there's a recognition that if you inhale asbestos that it sort of mixes with your body and that's not a good thing and maybe you'll get mesothelioma maybe you won't but in that case you know you can get monitoring i mean we see it with the football cases and the concussion cases maybe you'll get some type of um you know head issue later on in life but you can get monitoring the plaintiffs here aren't seeking monitoring they're seeking money damages but they haven't plausibly alleged a harm or an injury in fact that's the that's the distinction that's the problem and why they don't have standing let me just see whether judge ripple has uh... any follow-up questions thank you thank you